everyone, my name is T and I'm on the Vancouver Startup Week team. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are grateful to be virtually gathered on Indigenous land, regardless of where you are joining us from. I'm grateful to be on the traditional, ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish peoples. I'm privileged to live, work and play on these lands. First, I'd like you to thank you for joining us for VSW 2021 and welcome to Financing Your Purpose Driven Startup Through Impact Investing, a fireside chat with Spring Activator. This session is also part of the VSW Founder Track and is proudly supported by Sage Accounting. Sage knows you didn't start your business to become an accountant. Sorry to any accountants out there, um, but Sage Accounting will keep your business organized, running smoothly, track your cash flow and send out invoices and get paid quickly. So you can check out the Sage accounting booth to access free guides and templates for starting your business finances the right way. Plus get an exclusive VSW discount if you're ready to switch from Excel. Um, during the sessions, if you have any questions for our speakers, please post them in the Q&A on the Whova sessions and you can also upvote other questions from other speakers. I'll now pass the mic over um, to the Spring Activator team and we'll begin. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new day of VSW. I'm just going to make sure we can share our deck here. Awesome. Uh, my name is Camilla, and I work on Spring Activator's marketing team. And oops, some tech issues got my full screen popped up, and I can't see my notes. <laughs> um, I work on Spring's marketing team. And on behalf of Spring, it's my pleasure to welcome you here today at this event on fundraising impact capital for your purpose-driven startup. So we already had a little bit of housekeeping about the Q&A session, and we have some polls that are running right now as well. And we'll have a few polls that will launch about 20 minutes into the session. These are to help us know who's attending today and also your experience with fundraising so that we can better interact with you throughout the session and during the final um, portion of the fireside chat. So a little bit about Spring Activator, we exist to change the world through innovation, and we do this by helping entrepreneurs, investors, and entrepreneurship ecosystems develop through our programming and advisory services, and all of this we do with an impact-focused lens. To date, we've trained over 750 alumni and supported over 100 partners in more than 80 communities around the world. And I'll jump to the next slide, please. So this is a how many communities we've supported and we've also trained uh, the over 750 alumni and then also to the next slide please. Our home base is in Vancouver, Canada and our work extends globally and we've currently got some really exciting projects brewing in the Balkans and Peru as well. Um, today you will be hearing from Springs Impact Investing Team and also Spring CEO Graham Day, Hilary Kilgore and Keith Ipple. All of these um, amazing people that I have the pleasure to call my colleagues have extensive experience with fundraising, impact investing, and developing entrepreneurial ecosystems. Formerly the chief financial officer of Systema Bio, Graham has raised over Graham raised over $15 million in financing to fund this company's expansion across four continents. Prior to this, he was an impact investor investing in early stage and growth stage businesses. Hillary focus on, focuses on helping impact venture scale and her experience spans Fortune's 100 fastest growing companies. Some of you might know her as a CEO activator where she is building their follow on fund. She has also been recognized by Clean 50 and Corporate Knights for scaling impact for global organizations. Last but not least, Keith has over two and a half decades of experience as a leader in technology and impact businesses. He has raised over 30 million in angel investment and venture capital, and he leads Spring to accelerate companies and ecosystems and to activate impact capital. Today, Keith, Hillary, and Graham will walk you through fundraising basics, an impact investing overview, and a few case studies, after which we'll have space for a Q&A. And speaking with entrepreneurs like you over the last few weeks, uh, we have heard some recurring questions and challenges that, that you face from an, from an investment standpoint. And we have designed today's session with these challenges and questions in mind. So throughout the session, if you ever have any questions, pop them into the Q&A, feel free to engage in the chat. Don't forget about the polls. Um, and without further ado, I would love to give the virtual floor to Keith. Amazing, thanks, Cam. Uh, and everybody, I don't know if you heard that, but Cam said that I've been around for two and a half decades. So clearly she owes me a coffee next time. Um, I always, 
right? <laughs> I, um, I'm so excited to spend this time actually with Cam and Hillary and Graham. Um, it's the first time we're actually doing a workshop together uh, as a part of uh, Vancouver Startup Week. Um, I have the good fortune of uh, being a part of Vancouver Startup Week since the very first in 2014. And uh, really, really excited to uh, dig in today as well. So um, I'm going to dive right in. And um, what we want to do is we want to spend a bit of time talking about um, kind of the foundation of, uh, you know, kind of raising capital for our business. And, and there are some elements that are universal truth for all types of businesses. And then what we're going to do is we're going to extend that into, um, into the impact realm specifically. And so what we've been hearing, and just to, so that everybody knows, I just got off a call with a group of impact entrepreneurs in Calgary. And through uh, that session, through the sessions at, at Startup Week, you know, we've really heard people talk about, you know, I want to raise capital and I want to raise impact capital, but like, how do I actually get started? And so what we want to do is kind of demystify that process first and foremost, and then um, take it from there. So if we move on to the next slide, um, what we're going to do is we're going to cover off the first steps of starting your round. And so we want to really demystify it. 10 steps that you will go through. So first and foremost is to set goals for your round. And it is important to note that the, you know, I, I would say about 90% of the founders that I meet do not set goals, do not have clear goals aside from an amount. And so the, the really critical here to, to make sure that we're actually set up for success because raising capital is work. It, it can be a full-time job on top of a full-time job. And so we want to make sure that we do it well. Um, second, we want to focus on our ideal investor. And we'll talk about that um, in a little bit uh, with Graham and Hillary. Um, but it is important to note that somebody who is wealthy does not make them an ideal investor, right? You know, there's, we want to look beyond the check. Um, and so it's a great opportunity, especially for us as impact entrepreneurs to really find those people who are values aligned and believe in what we're doing. Notice that step three is where we meet a lawyer. So notice I don't say hire a lawyer, but meet a lawyer and pick one. So we're looking for a lawyer who knows how to do fundraising. Um, the benefit in Vancouver is there's many fantastic law firms, but find the one that you trust, find the one that you believe is values aligned and really is kind of a fit for your organization. So our goal here is to pick it now and start to establish that relationship. Then what we wanna do is build our forecast. Notice I say best case, worst case and base case, base case or target. The reason is because very often in the process of due diligence or, or the homework phase, that investors will ask us like, what happens if your revenue is half or what happens if you can't expand as quick or what happens if, right? And so the, the, the worst case is really designed to answer what if and to allay concerns, right? To, to, to convey that we understand what we're trying to do um, and that we can adapt. Now, best case scenario is not only about being optimistic, but it's also one of those scenarios that we see happen regularly at Spring where an impact investor looks at your business, they get excited and they say, well, what if you raised more? Or what if I invested more? And so uh, a best case scenario forecast helps you to say with additional capital, here's the incremental kind of growth or the incremental impact that we can have. Step five is to then build that homework folder. Due diligence is just the fancy investment term for homework that an investor does on you and your company. And so that folder is often a Google Drive folder or Dropbox folder, and we start to drop things in. If any of you are interested in a due diligence checklist, connect up with myself or Hillary or Graham after the session, um, and we'd be more than happy to provide a template. Um, now, notice number six is where we create our draft financing documents. So this is where we're narrowing in on like, is this common shares, convertible notes, safe agreements, uh, or preferred shares? Like what is the form? Start to put those together. The reason why we do it before we pitch is remember that angel investors are a microcosm of humanity, right? So some people are deeply analytical, thoughtful, and conservative. Other people are emotional, impulsive, and fast. And so it does happen. We're in the first meeting, an investor says 45 minutes in, hey, great, I'm in, send me the paperwork. So you need to be prepared, right? Number seven, notice pitch deck comes here, right? So pitch deck is the sizzle. So build the stake so that you can actually create the sizzle, 
right? So know your goals and objectives, who you're pitching to, make sure you have all your homework. That allows you to build a really, really fantastic deck. Then we figure out a way to get warm intros to those key investors that we identify through that ideal investor profile piece, practice our pitch, and then we start to reach out with warm introductions, ideally. Um, and we're going to move on to the next slide. And pregnant pause, great. Um, so actually, sorry, you can delete, you can just move on from this slide. Um, so we're going to move into goal setting. And so in goals, um, again, most people just have a number. So first and foremost, who is your ideal investor? So remember everybody that you would not sell your product or service to anybody, right? That would be a waste of your time. Everybody has a target customer for your product and service. It is the same for your ideal investor. Um, and the second is to also think about the raise amount. And in particular, um, we're thinking about, do we raise our target amount? Let's use around number 500,000. But the reality is, is that many investors, or sorry, many entrepreneurs don't get to the number. So what if you can only gather 350K worth of interest or 375 or 400? So it's really important to know what is the minimum that you would take and be in a place where you can signal to investors that you're looking to get up to the target, but you would take less if it made sense. Um, and then the maximum amount, of course, is in those cases where people get excited. So um, Hillary and Graham and I know a company in Vancouver. It's in the clean tech space. They were originally intending to raise 500K. They have received extensive interest. And so they evaluated and made a decision to expand their round to a million. So that's a good example of like they had a target. Interest was there. Now they're expanding their target into a maximum. And then in addition to that, um, you get a chance to think about what kind of money um, and what kind of money is really important because investors value entrepreneurs who take a balanced approach to raising the right capital, which includes accessing grants, loans, crowdfunding if it's applicable to your venture, um, friends and family if it's applicable um, and if it makes sense for you. Um, and then um, in addition to that, um, angel investors, of course. One other thing I will quickly highlight, when do you want the money in the bank? Remember everybody that the most seasonal business in the world, I think is chocolate, um, which really only sells three times a year. Um, the second most seasonal business is fundraising. Angel investors are wealthy individuals. They go on holiday in July and August and they go on holiday in December. So if you came to me and said you wanted to put the checks in the bank by August 15th, my answer to you is it will not happen. You either get the money in by June 30th or you get it in by October 15th. It is a seasonal business. Please keep that in mind. Um, and so you want to make sure that you kind of plan your cash flow and, and plan your raise accordingly. So if we move on to the next slide. Um, now we're moving into ideal investor. And so... Um, this is an opportunity for us to think a little bit about what ideal investor means. And so in this context, ideal investors really are in this sequence. So they are industry aligned. So in other words, they understand your industry and they get it. Um, it saves you from having to pitch them and educate them on the industry. Um, and they can bring potentially strategic value beyond the check, experience, wisdom, network connections, et cetera business model, they get how you make money. Now in the right network, I have it very specifically prioritized. When you're raising capital, you're looking for investors who can connect you with other values aligned investors that can help you close your round. And then if they have access to customers and partners, please like great, great value add that can, can happen there. Um, number four is they have geographic relevance. I love to see local investors involved. You can meet them for coffee, socially distanced today, close up in the future. Um, and a great way to kind of brainstorm and kind of have that fluid motion. Um, and in addition to that, um, people who are have geographic understanding and wisdom about places where you're looking to expand to. And then the last piece is to be returned and or exit aligned. So um, Hillary and I are actually working with a company right now, and that company is looking to exit by the end of 2025. By articulating that out loud to investors, it's great because some investors are like, no, 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 I want to be in for 10 years and make a billion dollar company. 
that's cool. It's just not aligned. Great. Like our goal through this process with ideal investor, right? Best answer is a quick yes. Second best answer is a quick no. And maybe is the death of a round, right? So, so let's just make sure that we do that. It is important to note that overarching all of this is impact alignment, right? So what is it that you're trying to do and how? And so the way that we dig into that is actually in the series of conversations that we have and by doing references on the investor. Um, and it is important to remember, if you're willing to do references on people that you hire as employees, surely you must be willing to do references on people that you are selling a piece of your business to, right? And what I would say to you is quality impact investors really value when an entrepreneur asks for references because it shows that you care and are serious about that piece of equity that you are giving up and the partnership that you're getting into for anywhere from you know two to 12 years or beyond. Um, so it's a really great way to think about it. Um, and this really gives you kind of like a, a basic foundation for how you're thinking about laying a groundwork. This is all universal truth for all companies. And so now what we're going to do as we move to the next slide is we're going to now extend this specifically into the world of impact investing. And in order to do that, I'm going to hand it over to Graham. Thanks, Keith. Uh, great to set the stage um, with those with those basic principles that apply whether the whether the investor is impact or not, whether your business is impact or not. So that that's the groundwork that, as Keith says, are, are universal truths. But what about impact investing? So important here to understand a bit of the the the, the history here. This is a movement, um, and I say movement because I think it really is one that started. Uh, now over 20 years ago, it's moved at different paces in different in different regions, um, but it's definitely a huge a huge trend and an exciting one at that. And there are different ways um, that uh, people speak to it, but there is a generally uh, agreed upon definition, and that is that impact investments are those that are made with the intention to generate positive, measurable social and environmental impact alongside a financial return is, is quite a bit to unpack there, right? So one would be this concept of intentionality. So when an impact investor, a true one, is putting capital into a, a company, they are linking that capital to a series of, uh, of outcomes um, that create impact. So they're watching where that capital is spent and what it's going to create. And they want that to be measurable. We all do. Um, we want to be able to see what that capital did, what the uh, company did in a series of quantifiable metrics. Um, and then the final piece there is this concept that it is that there are two pieces here. There's the impact that the investor is looking for, but they are also looking for a financial return. This is not uh, philanthropy. So as, a, as an entrepreneur, as you're navigating impact investing, um, perhaps you've done this already, or maybe this is your first time thinking about it, you need to understand the, the spectrum of impact and, and returns, which we'll talk about uh, next slide. We'll talk, uh, you'll need to understand how to respond to questions about your impact thesis or your model, and then how you intend to measure that impact. Now, the spectrum is an interesting one to think of. So for a long time, you could you think the, these two concepts live in very different worlds, right? You have traditional investing on one side, you know, this is just return seeking, optimizing portfolio in economics. This is Milton Friedman's ideas of, you know, capital should be seeking the highest return places to grow the company, to grow uh, economy. And that is, um, you know, that, that purely returns seeking. On the other side, you have philanthropy, right? In a way, purely um, impact seeking. You never expect to see that money uh, come back in a financial way. You expect those, those returns to be purely, purely social. And you see this in action actually still today in many family offices or foundations that are investing their capital in sort of standard capital markets, getting optimizing their return as high as they can, and then they take part of those returns and give it to charity. 
So still you see this, this polarization, but more and more you see uh, different uh, concepts that are blending these two together. And this is where it gets really exciting. This is actually Sonnen's Capital's um, version of this. You'll see different terms. There's still, I think, a lot of work to be done in the space to align on some of these terms you see in the middle. But broadly speaking, as you move from left to right, you move from the traditional investing of return, financial return seeking to more impact first uh, uh, seeking on the right. So if we take responsible impact investing as a, as a category, as a name, um, this is basic, this is traditional investing, but it's taking out uh, uh, sectors or business models that uh, we believe are, you know, negative to, to impact. So these examples you see below negative screens on, say, tobacco or alcohol or, or weapons or whatever that investor, be it an angel, be it a fund, uh, is, is, is believing is, is, is negative. The next one, sustainable impact investing, is a bit more blended. It's a more general concept around sustainability. So here you see some examples of carbon footprint, waste reduction. So if you imagine you're in a room with somebody who's aligning with this, they're asking you, so generally speaking, are you aligned with these? I think B Corp in some ways is, is, is measuring out a lot of the concepts in this sustainable impact investing uh, uh, sort of pillar here. Thematic. Uh, would be more when the investor is specifically focused on solutions in specific areas. So they may have uh, specific experience there or knowledge that they're bringing to the table and they're looking to see how your solutions measure up when it comes to say climate change or urbanization or water scarcity. So quite targeted. And then impact first investing is now a category where it's explicit that those investors are highly prioritizing the impact side to the and which are taking precedent over financial returns so these are conversations where the, the 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 investor may look at the business the model and say okay this is what's going to happen in terms of impact and it looks like that means that i could have a potential return of only five percent or prime and i'm okay with that so that's on the impact um, first. So you see all of these different things. And, and it's not to say that everybody will speak the same language. People, uh, in, individual investors, angels, funds may not even be able to fully um, self-determine where they are here. But by asking these kinds of questions, you all get a sense of where they are. And to Keith's points on alignment, that's extremely important for the investor relation going forward. Now, the more impact oriented the fund is, the more they're going to ask the companies for their impact model, also known as theory of change or even a logical framework if you come more from the developmental um, practitioner side. And this is basically just trying to tie the story together. So when, as entrepreneurs, many times, many of them that I've met have come and said, our impact is the following sustainable development goals. We do um, hunger, um, poverty reduction, uh, less hunger, we do healthy cities, and, and that's where they stop. However, a impact investor will ask for a much sort of fuller picture of that. And they're referring to something like this. So they'll start, um, you'll start by explaining what the company's plan is on one side and what those expected results on the other. And you'll, you'll see this is quite logical. On the one hand, you have inputs that are coming into the company. These are capital, talent, materials, other infrastructure, whatever goes into the company. Those create a series of activities. So it could be manufacturing, selling, training, anything that the company does. And those lead into the outputs. So far, so good. These outputs are uh, can be your financial outputs. I've got some examples here of the number of suppliers, sales made, clients reached. Um, so in the example of uh, for perhaps a fair trade coffee company that's working um, in um, different parts of the world, selling coffee here, you know, they have their coffee shops, for example, they have their supply chain, uh, maybe they're roasting here in Vancouver. Um, but one of the outputs from an impact perspective that they're interested in is how many suppliers or coffee growers are they uh, working with and who, how much are, are they paying them if they're 
uh, their model could be that they're saying, we are going to pay premium for premium um, coffee that we're going to sell here in Vancouver from coffee growers in Guatemala. So the outcome there that you're assuming is the additional income to suppliers. Um, in other models, let's, it could be savings to clients. For example, if you're creating a cheaper product, uh, least less expensive product for a, for, for a vulnerable population, you're generating savings. Or maybe in an environmental model, you're displacing greenhouse gases. Whatever the case, those then all uh, map to the impact, which are those can be those sustainable development goals. So reduce poverty, uh, food security, reduce climate change, whatever it is. So in my coffee example, you have those, you have the roasting is the activity, they're getting it from the suppliers, they're paying a premium to those coffee growers, so they're gaining them additional income, and that you assume will reduce, uh, will create reduced poverty, for, ex for example. So if you're claiming reduced poverty through your coffee model, you need to then explain these pieces and the assumptions that go through each, each one. Now, if you're if you're early stage in this, this this is not something I'm saying to intimidate anybody. This is just that framework, that narrative that you have to start um, really digging into as you speak um, to more sophisticated impact in the investors. So expect these questions and expect them digging into the assumptions. So when you, and it comes to bringing when you, you know going back to what Keith was saying, you're looking for your ideal investor. How do you know when you come together with with alignment. So your investor has their own sense of um, what they believe is their the best social return for their investment. So that's their values, their interests, what they've told their, their potential investment partners, they're going to be working, uh, what sectors they're going to be working in, risk appetite. That's the fund or the person or the angel or the family office's impact thesis. That's what they believe they're, they're, they're doing and why. On the company side, you have your um, your values, you have your impact story, all of the things we just talked about in terms of inputs, actions, and that's the impact model. And where those two come together is, is alignment. Now, I'll just go into one more piece of this. So you have your impact thesis. The next questions that you're, you may get from your impact investor is what, um, how are you going to measure that? And there are sort of three principles that we point out in impact measurement. One is that you're trying to quantify the impact. Yes, impact in many uh, senses is hard to quantify. Um, if you're working on awareness, uh, general awareness, for example, for an issue, it can be challenging. But you, in order to really um, in prove that the, the model is working, you need to find uh, metrics that you're going to, to quantify. Sometimes those are really aligned with your business. So if you know that for every unit, um, for every, let's say, uh, uh, new user you have on a educational platform that's um, teaching people better to do write, write their provincial exams has a certain effect on, on their score, uh, great. And um, that means the, just the more signups you have, um, the more impact you're having. The other one, uh, the second one here is understand and communicate the baseline. So if you are claiming that you have created uh, greater awareness, um, greater awareness in your community about, um, let's say, homelessness through your media app, um, and you do a survey and you find that all of a sudden you know, 20 people recognize this as a key issue in their neighborhood, great, but what was it before you started? How much can you attribute to what you have been doing? And that's the third point of additionality. How much of what you've seen in terms of uh, impact change has been thanks to thanks to you? So when you think about it, you, you can probably imagine, oh my God, there's uh, hundreds of different indicators that I'll need to measure. Not so. Most impact investors are looking for just a few indicators that will really get to the, to, to the bottom of it. So they're looking for an indicator, a result, and they're looking for uh, a, an explanation of how you measure it. Um, so in an educational platform I have here as an example, could be the indicator could be number of students served. So let's say you say that was 151 students and that I measure that by unique users on my platform. So you specify how you're measuring it to make sure there's no confusion on how your, your metrics could, could change um, over, over time. So lots of different ways to, to, to think about um, to think about different 
different metrics, different different um, different ways of the thesis. Um, but what's what I'm what I hope you take away from this is there is a a language that's developing in impact investing. Uh, that language and the depth of it and the depth of that discussion depends a bit on where they are on that spectrum I talked about. So as you as a as a company might be thinking about where to raise capital from, you can first figure out where they are in that spectrum and then be prepared to follow to back that up with um, with uh, a narrative of your of, of your thesis of your chain of your model and what are the kind of key elements you can point to in terms of quantifiable metrics that you can prove what you're saying is happening. You can prove that your pilot has done this or that your first few years of growth has done this and projecting into the future the kind of impact you'll have. So I think um, some interesting thoughts there. Hillary, I know you've seen a lot of different um, companies can go through this. A lot of what I've said is theory, of course, but a lot of it is, uh, you know, is becoming more and more the language. I mean, just before you start on your case studies, I'm curious, what would you say in terms of, uh, you know, advice to, to entrepreneurs going out and, and having to speak this language to potential investors? Great question. I, uh, I have the pleasure of following both of you because Keith has really laid out the idea of what does it look like to go after investment and Graham, you distinguish this idea of from an impact perspective, why is the impact important? And I think I think the key thing that I was I was really reflecting on and hearing you speak is, you know, why is all this impact measurement and impact thesis important? Well, the key thing, and Graham, this is what I'm seeing uh, in the ventures that I'm working with uh, and the we're working with is if I want to go after investors who care about impact, then I actually need to their language over time that we're actually going to be able to deliver on the type of impact that we've talked about. And we all know greenwashing, you know, I went to school specifically to figure out how do we make sure that we're, we're getting rid of greenwashing. And really, when we think of impact investment, the tools and the theory that you just talked about is the language and commitment that's needed to get the type of impact investors, whether they're angel, institutional, et cetera, but the people who care about impact wanna see that you've actually thought about what impact actually looks like. So really appreciate yeah. that framing, really helpful. Graham, do you wanna add anything to that before I dive into the case? Or Keith, any additions to that as, before I jump into some tangible case studies? I think for me, great summary. Looking forward to the case studies. Yeah, I, I would just add before you start, Hillary, is that having it, having the really the, the meat and the and the clarity behind the assumptions of impact is kind of a defense of the whole sector from what you said of of, of uh, challenges to impact investing. That oh, it's you know it, it's greenwashing. Um, if, you know, people are just sort of putting it out there to, to you know, try to attract different investment, even though it's not core to the business. Having all this set up sort of you know, proves that this is a real movement. There's solid academic and practical thought behind this. And I think that's what makes it exciting. That's why you see certain uh, you know, regions and ecosystems really pushing this forward uh, with private investors, with governments behind it, because starting to see, no, this is real and this can be proved. And once you're once you're at that level, you know, sky is the limit for for how far uh, this movement could go. Awesome. Well, thank you both. I'm going to jump into the case studies to just land this into some real examples. So, if you move to the next slide, I uh, I get to start off with an example that's very local, and I think a lot of us are quite familiar with. Uh, which is NADA. So for those of you, uh, a couple years ago, you may recall that this idea of a package-free grocery store first emerged out of the Patagonia Stolano on 4th. They really started first small and built over time and now have a brick and mortar store uh, just 
just off of Fraser, Fraser and Broadway, uh, and have really grown and scaled as they've gone through this. So they were founded in 2015. They uh, were one of the first package free grocery stores in the region and have since evolved to a delivery service. And really they're just a grounded in what they do and why they exist from a mission perspective. They exist to be about just food. So connecting people to their food, um, as you can see, but I think that the key thing there is supply chain and circular economy. Circular economy has become a very, uh, a bit more common for those people. Uh, we're hearing great examples of circular economy solutions. What does it look like to build a circular economy supply chain, uh, which is really what uh, NADA is doing. So quite revolutionary, quite when we think of, uh, tech, we think of disruption, quite disruptive to the food space, uh, and, and just to ground it in kind of what their business model is, uh, they have four, four different business models. So uh, they all integrate, and it's really this idea of how do we deliver food to the user, and have really pivoted through, uh, through COVID, which uh, you know, is always a challenge for entrepreneurs. So uh, online is a significant portion. Retail, as I mentioned, with a cafe, they've got their own products. Uh, and I'll speak a little bit. Uh, the homemade products, as well as the carbon neutral delivery, are both responses to their impact thesis. So if they're thinking about how are we addressing, when we think of that, um, that theory of change that Graham was talking about, as we grow, more people are coming to our stores more distribution in terms of supply chain, as well as we need to get our products, especially in COVID, direct to our consumers. Uh, and what are ways that we can actually grow but reduce our negative impact? And so Natazone, as well as their carbon neutral delivery, options do that. So instead of cars driving, uh, so they're reducing their negative impact there uh, from a, a homemade product. So we, if anyone knows the grocery store industry well, um, they, instead of getting rid of their products, if they're not sold, they're converting them into a homemade product that actually has a higher margin than any of their other products. It's got a 75% margin because they're converting what would have been waste for thinking circular economy into a new product that they can actually sell at a higher yield. So just some examples of how that impact uh, theory of change comes into play. And if I, if I think of the examples that we heard from both Keith and from Graham, it's so important. They're launching their raise this week. It's a seed round raise sorry, a seed round raise for $3 million, really focused scaling. So they currently cover the, uh, the lower mainland. We're in Vancouver, it's Vancouver Startup Week, but are really looking at the idea of how do we expand beyond the Vancouver market, both across the country, as well as potentially going into the States over uh, a couple of years. And so those are really what they're raising for. Not as a company, and that's the way I wanted to start with it, is that they're deep in impact. They were founded by Brian Miller, who is a biologist, really looking at how do we get rid of plastic waste. So the sustainable development goals are really critical to them. They talk about them regularly in their business, uh, and you've got the four of them there. But I think the key ones that I'll, I'll draw to is the responsible consumption and production is when you think of that theory of change, how they're talking about the outcomes that they're trying to deliver and the behavior changes that they're driving in their consumers. Um, the other part is that they're a proud B Corp as well as a 1% for the planet. So they're really trying to walk their talk and show that the things that they're saying they're doing and the outcomes that they're trying to drive, if you look back to that theory of change, are also reflected in how they operate as a business. We don't just say we want to do these for our end user or our end community, we're also doing them in our business and how we operate. So that's an overview of NADA. NADA is currently launching their raise. Uh, to answer some of the questions that Keith shared earlier, uh, their ideal investor. So when they're thinking of their ideal investor, they're really thinking about values alignment, impact first, um, as well as industry expertise. So uh, food, e-commerce, warehouse, really thinking about if we're raising $3 million with these investors and they figured out their investor mix uh, with a percentage of institutional investors, specifically looking at impact investors in that institutional space, um, as well as individuals 
and family offices. They're also thinking about, okay, well, how do we make sure that what's in our data room and what we're talking about, and, and that's where the theory of change comes in, lines up with the type of impact investor that we want to be working with. And so the, the example that I'll say is uh, a traditional angel investor and, and, and even a traditional family office, vision, your vision, where you're going, if someone is really deep impact and values alignment, which is what Nada is articulating as their ideal investor, then they're gonna start looking for these other pieces. So in your data room, you're gonna need a theory of change, which they have. You're gonna need a, you know, Nada has a PhD written report that shows that the, uh, the change from a carbon neutrality perspective is tested and proven. So some of those pieces that uh, are really critical to show that when you're a purpose-driven company, you're not just saying it, but you're really living it and doing it. So I'll shift. Um, actually, the, the key thing I'll add just from a journey perspective on their, um, on their impact is they have done a family round in the past. So they've done a family and friends round in the past. They have raised capital. This is their next round. They're really looking at it as a seed round uh, with the intention, intention of potentially doing a series A in the next year and a half or two years in looking at more of that cross-country Ontario, Quebec market. So just thinking, and, and we wanted to give you a little bit of that perspective of what does it look like to stagger or stage your, um, your rounds and thinking about what does it mean to get to where we want to be, but not doing it all necessarily at once. What I will say is unique um, is they have done all of this on very little capital raised to date. So if you think about it, they have built all of these operations vehicles with quite a small amount of money raised to date and now they're looking to um, to raise three million. So that's so that's that perspective on nada. Uh, and then we've got got care. So got care is an example of a venture that we have in our spring impact investment challenge currently. Uh, nada is an alum uh, and has gone through our programming in the past. Uh, got care is currently one of our five finalists that are about four weeks away from pitching for that $100,000 that we distribute uh, from investors who are going through our programs right now and learning about what impact investment looks like. So Got Care was founded in 2018, personalized home care, really looking at uh, how do you leverage a tech experience, but to transform elder care. They have a patient matching platform. They work with 15,000 plus, which is quite significant from a traction perspective already in such a short amount of time. Uh, they have a digital wallet. They've dedicated and paid their employees more than traditional home care options, just some of their distinguishing features from a model. And they're currently raising $6,000, sorry, $600,000 uh, to scale their R&D and accelerate the growth of their marketplace. So they're a bit different. And the reason I wanted to, to share the Got Care example is, you know, they're, they're looking at, we don't necessarily need, need this capital to keep our doors open or pay our employees and all of those things. They're looking at, we need this capital to get to the next stage of growth that we want to be at. We want to be across the country. We want to be in this many communities accessing and providing care at cost for a significant portion of people and they need capital to get to that next juncture. The key thing about GawCare, they are already generating quite a bit of revenue. And when they think about it, it's actually, okay, so we've, we've forecasted out what revenue we need and here's what we need to actually get to that next stage. Um, speaking to where they currently are and some of their ideal investors, for them, it was really important to have low touch investors. They also really want, when we see values aligned investors, people who believe in care at cost. There's a lot of solutions out there. A lot of us will know about them from a competitor landscape who, um, who are maybe looking at private healthcare options. That's not what Got Care is doing. Got Care is really trying to move towards this care at cost model where if I need home care and my insurance company is able to support me with that, then we're able to bridge that gap, pay people more, make sure that the quality of care is higher and provide more of those services for more people. So again, going back to that theory of change, those are the type of investors they want at the table. And one of the key questions, and it's something I learned from the founder of Got Care, is when she meets a new investor, she asks them, what is this investment gonna do for you? What is, when you think of like growth and impact alignment, 
by making this investment, what are you hoping to get out of it? Um, and it's something that she is able to have those conversations from a place of, can I deliver on the type of returns that this investor is thinking that they're gonna get from this investment? Are they looking for you know, five times, 10 times, 20 times return? And as a founder, can I actually deliver on that? And so that's a really big piece. The third thing I'll add is from a strategic lens, Got Care has a clear exit strategy, a clear plan of where they want to be in the next few years, and a sense of what type of strategic investors they want at the table with them to be a part of that. So those are two examples that we shared. Hopefully that gives you a little bit of color and adds a little bit of perspective to what both Keith and Graham shared. Um, and Graham, I'm gonna pass it back to you. I know we're gonna dive into our, our Q&A and, uh, and our next steps, but I'll pass it back to you to add anything that you wanna add as we wrap up. I think that was great. Um, it was great to see these two examples that you were so close to, Hillary, that you could speak to um, because I think the the magic is in all the details, of course, in that narrative of how they've come through their early raises and now poised to raise more and a position their impact in a way that they're speaking to specific uh, uh, investors. Um, so that was great. I, I, I know in, in my experience, I've worked with different um, company, companies that are also coming through different journeys, starting with those friends and families, bringing in an angel that bridges them to their first institutional investor and, and sort of really having to double down on the on the impact uh, um, metrics there and then that launches them into a uh, larger series a where now they have to deal with all sorts of investors and deal with good problems like um, i have this much interest they're all a little bit different on impact how do i put them together um so that we we can kind of function as a as a, as a company and as a board so the complexity just sort of continues as you go through raises so i think it was good to to bring up these two that are just on the verge of their first sort of more major uh, raises and, and, and watch their growth. So thank you for that. So I think we can now go into Q&A. Um, we're all watching the chat and I know there are questions that have come in and been answered there as well. Um, Cam is watching for that. Cam, are there any questions per se to, for us to uh, speak to on the stage? I don't see any new questions in the Q&A, so I'm going to encourage the audience to pop them in um, or even also in the chat. Uh, meanwhile, yeah, on the okay. polls, we, we did get a few results and, and he spoke to this in the chat as well about the theory of change um, that some of you are either less familiar or not familiar to, at all. So maybe that's a topic we can dive into a bit. Yeah. Um, so a couple of things that I would say, one is on the theory of change and Hillary and Graham, you can talk about this. I think theory of change as a term sometimes comes across as being academic or almost, you know, kind of like abstract, you know, people hear that term and they're like, whoa, what's that? And so I think it's really important that theory of change is, is a tool. It's a framework. I mean, fundamentally you can create it in six columns or five columns on a spreadsheet. You know, um, one of the benefits of a theory of change is that it's a nice, crisp way to share with a diverse group of people, which includes your team, as well as with investors, sometimes with partners and customers about like, hey, this is the problem we're trying to solve. And this is ultimately the impact we're trying to create. And everything in between is how we go about the process of doing that. Right. So, you know, what are, so when you see this term activities, right, it's like, well, what is the product and service that we offer? So, for example, in the case of Spring, you know, we offer workshops and we offer programs, training, advisory services, introductions. Um, so those are our activities. And then that leads to a set of uh, outputs. Right. And so those outputs, of course, are those easy things that you can measure things like, in our case, you know, the number of entrepreneurs that we train, um, the amount of capital that is raised. Um, uh, and we can also measure things like, oh, you know, like what was the gender diversity ratio or what, you know, what was the BIPOC diversity ratio or how many communities did we impact? So great things that we can kind of measure the output and then outcomes, we get to then start talk about the impact that we're having, like how many entrepreneurs were able to raise capital, how many entrepreneurs raised capital from female funders, how many gender diverse founders raise capital, um, you know, so there's a great way that we can go about that process. So it's a nice, tight way of doing that. But now that I've said that, Hillary and Graham, like when you've talked to entrepreneurs and they hear that term theory of change and they're like, whoa, what is that? You know, like 
how do you guys help to kind of demystify it for an entrepreneur? I'm, I'm happy to start on that because I agree it does come across as an, all of the terms for it are come across as academic, <laughs> whether it be theory of change or impact model. And the, the question from the investor may never actually use that terminology, but you will get them digging into the, the assumptions behind it. So um, an example I can give is, is companies that are uh, in fintech space, for example, and saying, okay, well, our, our impact is that we're expanding access to credit. And you think, okay, and, and that's where they sort of stop and you think, well, but what is your, what is the impact you're trying to create? Well, well, you know, more credit is better for people who can't access it. And you think, well, is it like, tell me more about that. And how does your product actually do that? And if, if they're not ready with those answers, they can, immediately turn off an investor who may then perceive like, okay, you're actually indebting a population that can't, um, uh, that can't handle that debt. Um, so, the, so it's being ready with the uh, answers that the, they may come at you, the questions may come at you in different ways and having that impact model kind of in your back pocket to have it clear in your mind is really the answer here, not necessarily uh, waiting the, uh, a question in the due diligence thing where they say, please give me your, your impact model. It's more about being ready with the answers uh, to the questions that they're, they're going to ask you inevitably. Uh, Hillary? Yeah, I think, I think the key thing is it's a tool that shows that your growth is aligned with impact. And I, I, will, I will say that again, it's a really important tool that shows that as you're going to grow, your impact is going to grow. And the reason I say that is, you know, I come to this space having worked in pre-IPO and post-IPO companies responsible for their impact. And so suddenly people really care about your impact model. But if you're, um, if you're sticking it on as an afterthought, you've missed a lot of opportunities. And so what impact investors are really seeing is that at the earliest stage possible, you need to make sure that impacted is not just a nice to have, is not just a sticker on top, it's embedded in how you're building. And it's actually an advantage to a fast growing early stage company to have really clear aligned goals for your team so that you don't get lost, you don't uh, you don't get missed, and your investors are along with you on that mission, rather than you doing a couple of U turns and coming back. Yeah, yeah and, and so yeah, I think that was great. Um, now, a couple of things that I wanted to highlight in the one poll, we asked the question: What are some pain points you're experiencing with fundraising? And so these are always fantastic things to talk about. And Hillary and Graham, I'm excited to kind of share a couple of these with you. Um, one of the pain points raised uh, was hearing you're a bit too early stage a lot. And so um, I'd love to give my perspective on that topic and, and Graham and Hillary have the two of you chime in as well. So hearing you're a bit too early the important part for you is you as an entrepreneur, you want to really understand what goes behind that comment. And I'll explain. So first, an investor might not invest at your stage, period. Right? Like they just might be like, I invest in companies that are doing at least 50 grand a month in revenue. And so you're just too early for me. Nice, transactional, easy peasy. The second one that is more challenging, um, but is also, I think, fairly factual, um, is that often when you hear that, um, and I always like to talk about, you know, we are Canadians, and so sometimes Canadian investors will give a Canadian no, right? So where they'll be like, oh, it looks interesting, but you're a bit too early, so maybe later, which is sometimes a Canadian no, right? <laughs> like, you know, so... So it's important to note that if an investor says to you, hey, you're a bit too early stage for me, what you want to do is actually dig deeper and say, t t tell me a bit more about what that means for you. And yeah. you know, at what point in time would we be at the right stage? Because sometimes the answer to that question is actually, well, I don't think you would ever be at the right stage for us because I really don't like your industry or I'm not interested in your space. 
Ah, now that's helpful. Thank you. Right. Or they can say to you, actually, I'm looking for you to be at a specific revenue number, or I'm looking for you to be in the market, or I'm looking for you to, you know, and they can start to specify. So one thing that I think is really important is if somebody is saying you're, your early stage or too early, what you want to do is clarify what that means because it's too vague, right? Is it revenue? Is it market traction? Is it product development? Is it team development? So what is it? And you want to find that out. And then the other key piece, and now I will go into the subtleties of that comment, which is your too early stage could also just fundamentally mean the following. Early stage investing by nature is character-based investing. Right, You're not doing $5 million a year in revenue. You have not been profitable for the last three years. I cannot rely on your financial statements. Ergo, it's a character-based investment. So, so often I see when people say you're a bit too early stage for me is the investor is fundamentally saying to you, I don't yet see enough for me to be able to trust you and your team with my money. So now what you want to do is start to ask yourself the question, how can I convey the progress that we've made as a team and where we're at, that I can increase the trust level. So I'm going to give you a working example, and I'm going to throw it over to Graham and Hillary. So there's a, a, a very, very well-known uh, venture capital fund in Vancouver that invests on North American basis. Uh, they're, they're growing quickly. They're hot. They're doing really, really cool work. When they meet, when they meet entrepreneurs for the first time, the first thing they say is, you have to be launched, you have to be in the market, and you have to be doing at least X amount in revenue. So they say that upfront. Now, what I'll tell you is the very first investment that they made, the company was barely in the market. They were doing like six grand a month in revenue. So, so the point being that that founder was able to convey the trust in other ways. And so, so in other words, too early stage is sometimes this catch-all for like, I don't know you at all. And so I'm going to apply a filter because you have not been able to convey trust. So now that I've said that, Graham and Hillary, over for you, for your perspective on this phrase, you're a bit too early. Hillary, I'll let you go quickly and then let's get to the next steps, which I'm going to share as well as you. Yeah. And, and to be to be frank, Keith, I, I reiterate everything you said. And I go back to something you shared earlier, which is more to have those conversations from uh, someone that knows both of you is so helpful because it helps get past what they're looking at in terms of numbers or where you're at or some of those screening questions and helps it come from a relational perspective. Um, and it also, when you're building your investor pipeline, it also helps you understand, okay, so here's what they're investing in. Here's the stage. Here's what they've told us. Let's look at this from a perspective of building a relationship that maybe they'll come in at the next stage um, or not. Maybe they can introduce me to two or three investors that they would recommend who might be better in my space. So uh, those are some of the avenues I would take from those conversations. But the key thing is you want to do it from a relational standpoint, not from a... Um, uh, we can prove you wrong um, yeah. through what we're doing. We have about a minute, Hillary. So do you want to just carry on and um, talk through these next steps for everybody before we wrap? Yeah, for sure. So following what we shared today, our challenge to you is if you haven't yet done so, please identify your ideal investor. Keith offered some key criteria in terms of what those could be. Um, and I would uh, challenge you also to think about what your investor mix is. Is it angels? Is it institutional? What type of institutional? Is it impact? Those types of things are really helpful. Um, if you're looking to raise now, uh, join us for one of our funding roundtables. Uh, the three of us, we get the opportunity to work with founders who are in the midst of this process. And I think the greatest thing is being a part of it with others and knowing that you're not alone. And then the third thing is if you're looking to raise uh, and you want to be a part of either starting your round, ending your round, we encourage you to join our Impact Investment Challenge that will be happening in Vancouver and, uh, and it will be happening this fall. So apply, reach out, uh, and we encourage you to watch our finale of the National Impact Investor Challenge, where one of the five ventures that we shared, Got Care being one of them, uh, potentially will get $100,000 from Impact Investment 
investors on June 17th at 4 p.m. So we invite you to join us. And Keith, Graham, I'm going to pass it over to you for final comments if there's anything else you'd like to add. I think that's it for us. Thank you so much. Um, there's lots of ways to connect with us. Uh, so you can see our updates. Um, we are ex yeah, humbly part of the sector, growing it uh, with you, with our partners, and uh, so happy for the time and uh, opportunity to speak here at Vancouver Startup Week. Yeah, and reach out anytime. We're happy to help. You can connect with any of us uh, throughout the course of the week, as well as through LinkedIn. Um, really excited to support you on your journey to impact.